Thanks very much. I really appreciate the interaction and, and the questions on that time. We, we have a little bit of a tidying up to do here to get ready uh, for it. That's why the talk's been delayed a little bit. But I'm ready to introduce uh, Jonas Burke now. Jonas is, is coming to us from Emerson, and he would like to uh, make his presentation here about plant modernization with pervasive wireless or, or blanket wireless. So, Jonas, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, yes. Uh, so, my name is uh, uh, Jonas Birch. I'm uh, based here in Singapore with Emerson. I'm the uh, Director of Applied Technology, which means that I'm responsible for helping users like you and your EPC contractors to adopt new technologies such as uh, wireless and, and Internet of Things and field mass and all of that good stuff. Uh, okay, so yeah, there. So I'm going to talk to you about yeah, plant modernization with pervasive sensing, all right, uh, infrastructure, all right. Uh, this morning when I turned on my computer, I got uh, this, well, I got two interesting pieces of news, in fact. Okay, so this was the first one. Fernando Alonso has special sensor for fitted formulation Grand Prix. Okay? Fernando Alonso's McLaren will be fitted with a special sensor when he makes his first appearance of the season in Sunday's Malaysian Grand Prix. Nearby this weekend, the device will help McLaren in their investigation into what caused Alonso's accidents in testing, and in particular, the driver's complaint that the steering was heavy immediately before he left the track at whatever. Yeah? Isn't this very interesting, okay? So McLaren has a problem. In order to troubleshoot this problem, they are putting in more sensors, okay? So that's what they're doing in F1, okay? And as you know, F1 cars, they're already chocker block full of sensors, right? In fact, what's happening in our industry right now is that plants, when they have process problems, they are doing exactly this. They are deploying sensors for process troubleshooting, okay? And they are innovating uh, the use of wireless sensors in ways we never imagined. In fact, when we started developing wireless sensors such as this one, we were kind of thinking of it of an, as an alternative for 4 to 20 milliamp and on-off signals. But users and plants aren't really using it that way. They are used, innovating new ways all of the time. They are instead using it for other things, such as this kind of troubleshooting. Okay? So I'm going to get to that. So that was a, that was a good gift this morning to, for me. To, I was struggling with how to kick off the presentation, you know? So, well, from the exciting world of Formula One, let me bring you down to my parents' car, and possibly your parents' car, okay? So my parents' car, it had four sensors in it. It had a speedometer, it had, a, was it a petrol level? It had a temperature and a low oil pressure indicator light. That's all. And it was all hardwired to the dashboard, right? And uh, so all of the data really goes to the driver. If there was any problem with the car, yeah, they brought it to the mechanic, you know, and he had his own, uh, what's it, ignition timing kind of tester, you know, for the belt, etc. In a modern car, you have anywhere from 60 to 100 sensors, maybe more, depending on what kind of car you're driving, right? And of course, all of these are digitally networked throughout the car, you know? could be by bus or it could be wireless, you know? Uh, wireless is used, for example, for the tire pressure sensor, right? Because you couldn't use wire for that. In fact, you still very much get very simple indication for the driver, you know? And, but most of the diagnostics is actually used by the mechanic uh, in, in uh, the workshop, okay? So this is what a modern car looks like inside. This particular model has about three different buses inside. Typically in our plant, when we talk about bus, we talk about field bus or mod bus or profi bus or something. That's not used inside cars. They use what they call CAN bus, okay? And the purpose of all of these buses is to make the car more reliable, 
make it more fuel efficient, make the car more environmentally friendly, and make the car safer. This is exactly what we want to do with your plant. We want to make your plant more reliable, we want to make it more fuel efficient, you know, uh, or uh, energy efficient, we want to make it, uh, your plant more environmentally friendly, and we want to make your plant a safer place to work, okay? So the way they did it in, the, in cars is to put in lots more sensors. We want to do exactly the same thing with your plant. We want to put in maybe three times as many sensors as you have in your plant today. Could we wire this in your existing plant? No way, you know? So wireless is really the solution to move forward here, okay? This one, sensors, battery operated, okay? So there is no power cable, there is no signal wires, okay? So it's very easy to deploy. And in fact, many of these sensors that I talked about are non-intrusive, okay? So you don't need to call the pipe fitters or the mechanical people to do it either. Okay, very uh, easy to deploy. So, carry on the analogy a little bit further. So the driver still has a simple check engine light, okay? You know, whereas the mechanic, you know, the driver is like the operators at the DCS console, right? They're like driving the plant. The mechanic is like, the, you know, it's like the maintenance department. They go and fix things, okay? So the mechanic, he get all of those, uh, you know, uh, vibration spectrums and waveforms and, you know, that advanced valve signatures and stuff, okay? So, you know, that's what we do with, with maintenance uh, as well, okay? So you can really perceive there are actually two different kind of systems. There's a system for the driver operator. There's a different system for the mechanic maintenance guy. So, when my dad's car used to break down, or I know if they have an issue, no, they want to check the tires. You know, so of course he needs to stop the car, he needs to get out of the car, roll up his sleeves, get his hands dirty, you know, with a pressure gauge to, set, to test the tire pressure. So you can say the human effort to do that was very high because there was no technology. Te low technology means high human effort, okay? So over time, things are getting better. Today, we have high technology. So now, by just pressing a button on your dashboard, you can get the pressure reading right there on the dashboard. You don't even have to stop, okay? So high technology means low human effort. We want to do exactly the same thing in your plant, okay? So instead of the operator having to go into the field and take a reading of pressure gauges, because Mind you, even if you have lots and lots of automation in your plant, you'll be surprised how many manual tasks there are there, you know, going on in the plant. A lot of data being collected manually still. So now what we want to do, instead of having the operator going to the field to collect this manual data, we want to bring all of these missing measurements into the, uh, to those that are using the data. It could be the operator or other people, okay? So, Really what I'm going to talk to you about is these missing measurements, okay? And they really come into four areas, okay? This is really users innovating all of this, okay? I didn't think of all of this myself. We just learned from the users and we threw it into four buckets, okay? Reliability and maintenance, energy efficiency and loss control, health, safety and environmental, and process operations of uh, productivity. Then I'm going to talk about how to integrate this with your existing control system because this is mainly used for modernization of existing plants. And lastly, very briefly, if you're building a new plant from scratch, how would you do it? Yeah? So, uh, so in the plant, okay, yeah, of course we have the operators sitting at the DCS console in the control room, okay, but also in the plant you have a whole bunch of other people that sit in offices beyond the control room. They are responsible for health, safety, and environment, reliability and maintenance, and energy efficiency, for instance. Okay? We have done a spectacular job of automation for process safety and process control. These guys get easily 80% of all of the data they need, okay? They are pretty well sorted, okay? They're doing okay, you know, because everything, you know, wire, hardwired, 4 to 20 milliamp, on off, you know, field bus, they get the data they need. However, the people beyond the control room, they are not so lucky. They maybe only get 20% of the data they need, and it's often manually uh, collected. So what we want to do, we want to fill 
this gap, you know, so that everybody gets the information they need. We actually call this pervasive sensing, you know, putting tons and tons of sensors uh, everywhere uh, throughout the world. Here's a slide I borrowed from, uh, uh, from ARC. Uh, well, you can see it over there in the back. You know, it talks about, you know, yesterday, as in a couple of years ago, energy was cheap, uh, water was cheap, getting rid of waste was, was also cheap, emissions were essentially free because they were not tracked, uh, raw material availability was, was predictable, there was plenty of people that were willing to work uh, in, in, in a plant and so on. Uh, so that was on the upside. On the downside back then was that control was very expensive, you know, because you need to have, you know, DCS has the expensive 4 to 20 million in and output card or uh, on off cards. Uh, you know, you need to have a wires, you know, each individual sensors, you know, many devices actually has multiple signals. So it was a lot of wiring required. Com software was expensive and computers were expensive, okay? So obviously what happens, a lot of things end up being done manual. Today, uh, things are different. Energy cost swings, hello, $120, $50, you know, <laughs> going up and down. So it's very unpredictable. Water, cost of, you know, water is a limited resource, so the cost is going up. Getting rid of waste is expensive. Emissions, you know, we have the fines, you know, which is a good thing, by the way. You know, raw materials may be more unpredictable. Limited talent to pool. Who wants to work in a plant? I want to develop apps for iPad. That's much cooler, okay? So that's on the downside today. On the good side, though, is that automation is a lot cheaper, you know? Because of wireless, you know? It's very easy to deploy uh, one of these sensors uh, in the plant, you know? Because I don't need to do all of the wiring. I don't need the ex expensive IO cards in my PCS. Uh, so, uh, computers is a lot cheaper, right? I don't even have to buy a computer. I just rent one in the cloud, you know? So, so it doesn't even take up any space. Software, I don't have to buy that either. I just rent it per tag, per month. Uh, okay, so, uh, you know, so many of the existing plants are getting old, you know, the plants that we have today, okay, and, uh, you know, they, they were really built with a bare minimum of instrumentation because instrumentation was so expensive 20, 30 years ago. So, whatever the process licensor said that you're going to have, that you have to have as a performance guarantee, that's what you put in, no more and no less, okay, but now we're getting a push to improve reliability, Reduce maintenance costs. We need greater energy efficiency. You know, there's new uh, health, safety, environmental mandates coming on all of the time, and you know, so and there's no way to tackle all of this uh, manually. Okay, so really, what we're now talking, all of this requires more automation. Okay, so when you come back to your office, okay, you really want to talk to the people in this, in these disciplines. You know, your reliability and maintenance colleagues your energy you know, process uh, colleagues, you know, your HSNE officer, and your you know, operations people, and say, okay, we, we've got some new technology I learned from Jonas, you know, and how, how we can make, make our plant uh, better. Okay, so it requires more automation, but you know, uh, doing it with, with wires is, uh, is simply not practical in an existing plant, because if I need to open up cable trays for laying more cable, or if I open up the junction box to fiddle with the wires, I'm going to break something and I'm going to be part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Okay? So, uh, we're not touching the DCS or whatever PLC or control system that you have. We're talking about adding an additional system for the other things, you know? Maintenance, reliability, health, safety, environment, energy efficiency, uh, and, and, and so on. Okay, so uh, the technology which is used uh, at the sensor level is wireless hard. Okay, uh, this is not really the, the because this is not the domain of uh, of Wi-Fi. One of the main characteristics of wireless hard is that it's extremely low power. So this device is battery operated. Any ideas of how long the battery lasts? Any thoughts? Your, your smartphone, right? The you have to charge it every day, isn't it? 
Except if you have an iPhone, then you have to charge it twice a day. Yeah? Uh, possibly more than that if you turn the Wi-Fi on. So any idea how long does this battery last? Yeah. Huh? Five years. Five years is pretty good, okay? Uh, yeah, this one actually can last for 10 years. This one is uh, actually extremely low power. So this, this battery can last 10 years. It could possibly last longer. The manufacturer of the battery says 10 years, so we also say 10, 10 years to be on the safe side, you know? Kiasu, as we say in Singapore, right? So, uh, you know, but it depends very much on the type of sensor that you are using. This is an acoustic sensor, by the way, so it's used for steam trap monitoring and relief valve leak monitoring, okay? It, it lasts 10 years. Pressure, temperature also lasts 10 years, you know. Uh, vibration monitoring would last maybe not so long, you know, and so, so, so it depends on the sensor type and it depends on the update rate, okay? This one I can run maybe an update, let's say, every 30 seconds and it will still last 10 years, okay? If I put faster than 30 seconds, you know, it will last shorter, okay? So that's why we're not really using uh, wireless for process control or, 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 or functional safety, okay? This is not SIS stuff, okay? These are, that's why I say this is beyond the PNID. You know, with 30 seconds, one minute, one hour, uh, you know, eight seconds, that kind of update rate is sufficient. Uh, the, I heard many times talking about how to make wireless work in an industrial environment full of steel, right? Somebody said radio signals don't penetrate steel. And yet we have steel vessels, we have pipe racks, we have structural steel. How do we deal with that? Okay, the answer is mesh topology, okay? So as you can see, that's a mesh topology right there. So you can see all of these devices, they form a mesh network. So every device can basically talk to a whole bunch of its neighbors, okay? So now what happens if one of these tasks gets you know, so maybe this guy communicates through this guy to that guy. You can do it seven hops, by the way. So you can hop around these kind of obstacles, you know, so the signal reaches, okay? So you can get greater distance, but most of all, it can navigate around the environment, you know, industrial environment. And even if somebody, let's say, raised some temporary scuffling or does some other work here, blocking this path, well, it automatically switches to another path, you know? Uh, so the data finds its way through. So we can get now greater than 99% uh, reliability uh, of the data, okay? Before mesh topology, nobody ever put wireless into the plant. Now with mesh topology, everyone is putting wireless into their plant, okay? So that, that was a, a major uh, breakthrough. Okay. I did mention that many of these sensors are non-intrusive, okay? So for example, the acoustic transmitter, this one, I just strap it onto the outside of the pipe, you know? So for example, in, in the plant, you probably, if you have in a refinery, you might have something, you know, have thousands of steam traps, for instance, okay? Uh, if, uh, so we're going to talk about those, you know? So this can be used on steam traps or relief valves, so we're going to talk about those applications. Uh, position transmitters sit on the outside of the valve, uh, this is a hydrocarbon leak detection just lies on the, on, on, on the ground, on the plant floor. Uh, vibration sensors, you can see outside, just, you know, uh, screwed onto the outside of a pump or whatever the case may be. Temperature sensors can actually clamp onto the outside of the pipe and measure the pipe surface temperature, which is pretty much the same as the temperature of the process fluid may not be used in the most critical of applications where you need to have decimal point accuracy, but in many cases, it's uh, more than sufficient. Uh, little DP flow transmitters like this can actually slip between two uh, flanges, etc. So these sensors can actually be deployed without mechanical work, you know? Other sensors, of course, need maybe some piping work. But even, let's say, pressure transmitters, you can just remove a pressure gauge and you put a pressure transmitter in, a wireless pressure transmitter in its place, okay? So very easy to deploy. Uh, I think everyone in this room, Thai Oil, Shell, ExxonMobil, everyone is already using this kind of technology, you know? You, you may not have seen it in your plant, but it's all out there, yeah? So where is this being deployed, okay? So yeah, it's really be, you, being used by your colleagues in the reliability and maintenance department, the, you know, uh, energy efficiently and loss control engineers in the process department, health safety and environmental department, and the operations department, okay? So in many of these uh, application areas. And, 
Uh, I'm just going to speed you through this, you know, just to give you an idea of how powerful uh, and useful this technology is uh, for the plant. And the beauty here is that basically with a single network can benefit so many different uh, departments in the plant. Okay? Uh, so really, for the longest time, we have talked about smart devices, you know, devices that have diagnostics, etc. Now we're really taking it to the next level, talking about smart equipment. That's really end of. And that smart equipment is really the way in which smart plants uh, are, are, are being built. Okay, so now we're talking about smart pumps, smart heat exchangers, etc. The way we are making this happen is, put, you know, through instrumenting these equipment. Okay, so they are digitizing all of the data right there at the uh, equipment. Uh, so, areas of uh, reliability and maintenance. So it's basically to improve asset reliability and uh, process availability and reduce uh, maintenance costs. Okay? Uh, uh, in your plant, you have some really major assets. You know, you have multi-million dollar compressors and turbines. All of those already have tons of sensors on them and protection system and diagnostic systems, etc. So these top assets are already taken care of, okay? So don't need to worry about that. But also in the plants, you have hundreds of pumps dozens of heat exchangers and other equipment uh, which are essential to the operation but have absolutely no monitoring on them at all okay so this and uh, what's being done today is that they're being manually spot checked you know by people carrying portable testers and doing inspections etc so now we're really talking about automating that so instead of doing it once a day once a week once a month doing it maybe once a minute or once an hour yeah so make it faster so we have developed, you know, solutions uh, for, you know, the most common equipment in the plant, or the equipment that caused the most problems, in fact, okay? Heat exchangers, pump blowers, air-cooled heat exchangers, uh, well, compressors, uh, cooling towers, filters, pipes and vessels, etc. So just to give an idea, so the reason why we focused on this is because these seven assets around the plant, you know, or categories, okay, uh, are the ones, they are actually uh, responsible for a 3.5% uh, production loss in the plant, okay? So, uh, if, we, if we can, you know, any reduction we can do in this, you know, will we'll definitely help the bottom line uh, of the company, okay? And in fact, the seven, seven same assets are responsible for about 76% of the maintenance spend. So uh, when it comes to you know uh, maintenance, I'm sure you've heard predictive maintenance, preventive maintenance. You've heard it many times. So to be sure, okay, to make it simple, there are two kinds of maintenance: uh, too late and too early. So too late means that the you know the equipment run until it fails, okay, and then you need to spend a lot of money on repairs. It strains the manpower because everything and everyone is in a rush, and you cause process downtime. You're you're not. Uh, producing anything, okay? It could also be equipment foul, okay? The heat exchanger gets dirty and inefficient, etc. okay? So that's when you maintain too late. If you maintain too early, that's actually not good either, okay? Because you get the very high maintenance cost, and even main doing maintenance also causes some uh, production downtime. It's scheduled production downtime, but it's also not so good. It requires a lot of manpower, and when you're focusing on, let's say you're wasting your time on something that does not need maintenance, you know, you're actually neglecting something that do need maintenance. Okay, so the question is, well, if you don't want to do maintenance too late and not too early, when do you do it, okay? Well, uh, today it's very difficult to tell when to do it, okay? Because, you know, when a maintenance manager comes into his plant, he doesn't know, he has so many pieces of equipment, he doesn't really know what is the problem with each one, you know, so he doesn't know where to start. So really what we do by, you know, putting sensors everywhere, you know, you can now know the health of a piece of equipment, okay? So by looking at his, he comes into the plant in the morning, he can look at the computer and he can see which equipment is healthy and which one is not, okay? And so it's just like today, if you're gonna go for a restaurant, you're gonna go to the movies, you're gonna go and buy something, you just don't go to the shop, right? You always Google everything first, you know? To see what show is on, maybe get the tickets, the product you want, what is the price, is it in stock, do they have the color you want, 
The same thing, you shouldn't be walking into the plant mindlessly. You should Google your equipment first. Check the pump. Is it really, is it really having a problem? Then you go into the field. Yeah? So what we're talking here about is data-driven maintenance schedule. Okay? Scheduling. So you put tons of sensors uh, throughout the plant, just like in the car we saw just now. Yeah? So it enables you to plan your daily maintenance, and it enables you to plan your turnarounds, you know? So you become more uh, effective, yeah? uh, So here is an example of how we do it, okay? So heat exchangers are available, are, are there in, in a lot of plants. So you can have, you know, each heat exchanger can have multiple uh, bundles, okay? So what we are doing is that uh, we do we deploy wireless transmitters on it for temperature, differential pressure, and pressure, etc. That allows us to detect fouling or inefficiency in the heat exchanger, or see, even see if it is plugging. Okay. As a result of that, well, we reduce manpower for manual inspection. You get lower maintenance costs. You, re uh, you you reduce your fuel costs, and you can even have shorter turnarounds because you know which heat which bundles to clean and which ones you don't have to clean. So really, somebody mentioned this actually. So when I'm talking about deploying let's say 4,000 sensors in a refinery, I'm not going to put 4,000 new PVs on the screen to the operators. They're going to go crazy. Too much data, no information. So really what we're doing, yes, we're using wireless sensors to connect, correct, collect data automatically instead of manually. So like noise level, pressure, temperature, and vibration. But then we're using software to distill this into information and even knowledge. Wisdom, well, that probably needs, still needs a, a, a human, okay? So uh, information could be like, you know, uh, so for example, temperature and flow is, is converted into uh, a calculated uh, heat exchanger duty and heat transfer coefficient. You can see trended. So that helps, you know, to, to tell, it can, software can even tell you whether to clean the heat exchanger or not. I use the heat exchanger here as an example. Here are all the raw data that we are collecting. You know, the temperature or the, uh, the steam flow, the product flow, we're measuring the temperature at the inlet and the outlet of both the, uh, the steam and, and the product. And so those are all the raw measurements and the differential pressure across. So you can have multiple sensors on each exchanger, okay? That data is very hard to make sense of, okay? So uh, information. Is computed, you know. For example, what is the duty and what is the heat transfer coefficient, and that's also being trended. So you can see over time how the heat exchanger is fouling and efficiency is going down. But lastly, to make it even simpler, further distilled into knowledge, you know, to clean or not to clean this heat exchanger. That is the question. Yeah. So it makes it a lot uh, simpler to use. So we're not bombarding people with tons of raw data. I'm not going to torture you with too many of these examples, okay? But basically, we do the same thing for pumps. So you can have, on a pump, you would then put vibration and other types of transmitters. You use the same software, but it's a different algorithms. You know, expert algorithms to compute the health of the pump and tell you what, you know, so the algorithm computes different types of diagnostics relevant to pumps, you know, but the results is basically the same. Again. Uh, cooling towers, different sensors, uh, different exploit algorithms, but the same software and pretty much the same result. Yeah? And on and on with different assets, uh, air-cooled heat exchangers, uh, uh, blowers and fans, uh, compressors, etc. Even corrosion, you know, on uh, on on fans and vessels. Okay, so. Uh, uh, so these are ways, you know, that basically yeah, plants ha have innovated with wireless uh, technologies. All of these are already uh, be being used uh, by, by plants out there. Yeah? Uh, you might have a lot of smart valve positioners, but the diagnostics from those valve positioners by not, may not be integrated into your maintenance software. Okay, so again, you put a wireless adapter on that uh, uh, positioner, and now you can access that diagnostics. Okay? So all of those are are, are, are wireless solutions, you know, uh, and uh, uh, that enable uh, improved reliability and maintenance. Okay? 
so you can tell Emerson, we are, you know, we kind of complement Cisco very well. You know, like I said before, or at least I tried to say it before, but kind of bungled it up. I'll try to get it right this time. So Cisco is about the internet, right? You know, and Emerson is about the things, you know, so internet of things. Right. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, okay, energy efficiency, okay? In your plant, okay, if you're in a refinery, so that is this one I'm talking about right now, okay? So steam trap is a little mechanical piece of equipment, which is very inexpensive, but when it's not working, it can cost you a lot of money, and that's what it is here is. This thing, by the way, is more expensive than the steam trap that it's monitoring. A lot of people have a difficulty getting their head around that, but let me explain why. This steam uh, trap can fail in two different ways. You know, it can fail either uh, flow through, which means it's uh, wasting energy, flowing steam, or it can fail uh, trapping condensate, okay? Which can create a water hammer that can damage your equipment, okay? Now in a plant, a refinery, you might have anywhere between eight to 10,000 of those at any one time, statistically, because the lifetime is about four to eight years. So any, any time, about 12% of those are failed, okay? Let's look at the more critical ones, okay? Maybe five to 10% of those might actually have been failed now. So that leaves us about 400 failed traps in a typical refinery. Uh, on average, those will waste about, you know, $10,000 worth of energy uh, every year. And because you only inspect the health of these guys once a year, you might actually end up wasting four million dollars worth of steam on steam, on steam, failed steam traps alone in a refinery. This guy can detect those kind of problems within one minute and report it to you. So now you can replace it instantly and basically theoretically save this much money in a refinery, you know? I have to speed up a little bit. Well, uh, other areas of energy is energy management. You might be familiar with ISO 50001. Okay, so really, energy management is about tracking the you know the major energy flows in the plant. Okay, easy to remember. Just think about wages: water, air as in compressed air, gas as in fuel gas, electricity, and steam. Okay. So a lot of plants, you know, uh, compressed air is being uh, wasted, electricity is being wasted, uh, water is leaking. So what, really what we're doing, we are deploying more sensors throughout the plant. So rather than just measuring the consumption of the plant as a whole, you can measure every plant area, every plant unit, or even down to equipment level, uh, if you will. And that helps us track you know, detect pumps and fans which are running when they shouldn't be. You can detect water leaks, etc. Again, by deploying more sensors. I've already talked about heat exchangers. By having cleaner heat exchanger, you reduce your energy cost. Uh, third area where pervasive sensing helps is the situational awareness, okay, to reduce incidents and response time. A lot of plants, you know, where chemicals are being handled, they have safety showers, okay? So, you know, if you happen to splash chemicals onto you, you dash to the safety shower or the eye wash station to rinse it off. It's very difficult to get onto the walkie-talkie and call for help at the same time. So what we are doing in the plant, we put wireless sensors there. So when the safety shower is activated, operators are notified and can send somebody to help this person, okay? Uh, so response times is greatly improved. And this is pretty much and in, the, in the certain countries, they have requirements to respond very quickly. When you hear about uh, fires, etc., in a refinery or other plants, you read that very often the investigation found that somebody had left a valve open that was supposed to be closed, or they made other assumptions. Well, now you don't have to make assumptions anymore because you put wireless position transmitters on manually operated valves. So now you can get the display at the operator so they don't make mistakes. And you can even have the interlocks on them. And there are plenty of those valves around. A refinery and many other plants can have hundreds or even thousands of relief valves, okay? You know, to limit the pressure in the piping to prevent explosions, okay? So it's a very important safety device, okay? All of these either vent to the atmosphere or more commonly into a flare. So the plant knows how much 
product or raw material they are wasting through the flare. But because hundreds of relief valves goes into the same flare, they don't really know where the problem in the process is because they don't know which relief valve is venting. Okay? And there are many other problems. After it releases, very often it doesn't seep back properly. So then it leaks from that point forward. Okay? So there's a lot of maintenance involved with this. Okay? And manual inspection, etc. Again, now, the same kind of acoustic transmitter just mounts on the outside of this and immediately detects uh, you know, if that when the relief valve is releasing, so you know what's going on in the process. Uh, you know, it t tells you if it's leaking so that you can send the valve for repair. So again, uh, you know, process troubleshooting, energy efficiency, etc. Fourth area I'm talking about, oh, sorry, what was that? To automate manual tasks. Too many tasks in the plant are still being done manually because they are missing measurement. Everything was not automated from the beginning. So in the plant you will still find many, you know, level gauges, pressure gauges, temperature gauges, variable area flow meters, and people are still walking around with portable testers and temperature plants. Instead of all of that, put wireless transmitters so that data comes into the operators or the maintenance technicians so they don't have to run around the plants as much. You can't eliminate these people. You still need them. But rather than collecting the data, it's much better for them to analyze the data and do something with it. You know, That's more productive. Uh, just to give a few examples, you know, uh, on, on off-site uh, tank farm storage tanks, there are so many measurements you can done, do, you know. Uh, many times the, the level is done manually, you can automate that. Uh, floating roof tanks, you know, big problem is if the tank is not, if the roof is not straight, you can detect uh, tilts and that. And yeah, too many, so many points which are manual on a tank that you can automate. We talked about wellhead. So many measurements points are not being done. 80% of the <coughs> wellheads in the world today have no automation. The only practical way to automate them is to put wireless sensors. Okay? So how do I integrate this with my existing system? Okay, that's the beauty. You don't have to replace your existing VCS to benefit from this. Okay? It all in integrates with what you have and your historian. Okay? So typically our architecture is something like this. So here's your DCS that you already have. You've got a safety system, well you've got the DCS itself, the SIS and the DCS. We call it ICSS together, right? So that all has the wired sensors and everything. Just leave that in place. Uh, you've got your wireless uh, transmitters here, you know. Uh, maybe only 20% of the data from those sensors will actually go to the control system or the safety system. It can be through RS-45, could be, can be through Ethernet, your choice. Okay? But you know, definitely Ethernet is being used to connect it maybe up to your asset management system. Okay? So you can see this is really a separate system. We're not touching your DCS, we're just adding a second layer. So this brings the data to the reliability and maintenance engineers, the energy and loss control engineers. HSE officers and so on. Yeah? So these people that didn't get the data before. A lot of plants use a plant historian. Again, Ethernet used to bring all of the data up to these guys. So you can see, you know, Emerson does this part down here, all of the sensors, you know, the wireless gateways. Also with, with, with Cisco, we're doing jointly gateways. And Cisco are required for all of this Ethernet functionality. Yeah? Uh, this is the second interesting piece of news I got today. And there's actually like uh, Emerson, we're ranked number seven as the most influential company in Internet of Things. You know? Well, Cisco is of course number three, you know, no, no surprise there, you know. But, you know, it really goes to show how, how, how well we work together. And I, I just got this this morning, you know, on the, on the Emerson blog. So really, uh, coming to the end here, we're talking about Internet of Things. You know, so Cisco's focus is really on the Internet. <laughs> And Emerson, we are more on the things, you know. So it is really a match uh, uh, made in heaven, there, yeah. And so when we talk about the technology, so the Cisco, you know, they handle all of the Ethernet and the Wi-Fi, the TCP, IP, and all of that, you know. And Emerson, we are more on the, you know, on, on, on the field bus, and, and the wireless heart is based on a radio technology called 802.15.4. Okay. So all of it, it's all standards. Okay. It doesn't. 
So happens is that it's not everything's not TCP IP, as somebody said, but it's standards uh, nonetheless, and it's interoperable between lots and lots of different uh, vendors. Okay. So yeah, well here is Emerson, our own uh, gateway, and we also have, uh, and then there's of course the the the, the Cisco uh, Wi-Fi uh, access point. Okay. So this gateway here is what you would use for you know with wireless sensors, just like this one. And the Wi-Fi access point, well, that's the one you use for people tracking uh, your, uh, you know, your portable cameras, your your mobile worker, laptop, tablets, that sort of thing. Okay. And actually, you know, at Cisco and Emerson, we have really collaborated. So we actually came up with this uh, device, which is called 1552WU. Okay. And which actually have Wi-Fi and uh, wireless heart uh, in into the same. Uh, unified box uh, in, 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 yeah. and also whereas you know I also talked about how you know Cisco does all of the uh, internet stuff you know and, and the Ethernet part so even let's say like you know with the Emerson control system you know you can use you know Cisco switch uh, hardware okay because you know for many of our customers Cisco is you know is, is basically the, the standard Ethernet Wi-Fi you know, IP gear that they use in those clubs, you know. So, yeah, we have actually validated, uh, you know, the Emerson control system architecture with, you know, uh, all of the Cisco uh, hardware. Okay, I'm not going to go through all the model numbers, but you're going to get the slides, so all of the, uh, all of those details uh, uh, are, are in there, okay. So, yeah, here, you know, I guess this is if you have multiple systems throughout your plant, you know, different plant areas. Again, all integrated, you know, using the Cisco uh, switches. Okay, and uh, yeah, well, there's a lot of. I'm more on the wi wireless hard stuff, you know, but with the, the, the with the Cisco guys in the room, we can walk you through uh, all of this. Uh, no issue there. So, uh, so I, I talked mainly about how to modernize the existing plant. So, well, if you're building a new plant today, put all of this Wi-Fi stuff in from the very beginning. You know so that you know don't build in a lot of pressure gauges and manual work okay automate everything from the very beginning okay and uh, so again just to, to stress everything which on the pni diagram okay control safety that has to respond in milliseconds wire it up using bus technologies etc you know your your colleagues in the reliability and maintenance energy efficiency department health safety and environmental and pro and operations uh, a lot of the data they need only is required every second, once a minute, once an hour. Wireless is superb for that. Yeah. So conclusion: Well, we have you know if you're interested in modernizing your plant, we have developed a 13-step process for that. I'm not gonna... And lastly, coming back to the car and the dashboard analogy, so all of these departments in your plant can benefit you know from this uh, you know. Uh, Sense additional sensors. Okay, so you can start by start today by just deploying all of the sensors. Tomorrow, you know, with all of the Cisco gear, you can really benefit from the Internet of Things. For example, uh, Shell FLNG, you know, the world's largest thing, floating thing. They have wireless sensors on there. Uh, the, the 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 vessel is gonna is built in Korea right now. It's gonna be located offshore of Australia. Uh, a lot of the maintenance engineers are onshore in Perth because they don't want to be offshore. So all of the data are sent, you know, to the uh, to the Perth office, you know, where you know maintenance will be managed. Yeah, if something breaks down, of course some guy on the on the ship will fix it, you know. But you by collecting all of the data and sending it onshore, you know, this FLNG uh, vessel uh, is reducing an amount of people required. Petronas, FLNG, is doing exactly the same thing. They also have wireless sensors sending the data uh, onshore. Okay, so do consider that. So I talked about three things. There are a lot of missing measurements. You can modernize your plan to cover all of those, and these are in those four different areas. Everything integrates with your existing historian and DCS, so you don't have to replace your DCS for this. There's no expensive infrastructure that you have to deploy to. to to benefit. If you're building a new plant today, to put this in from the very beginning. Okay, so this 
Uh, here's my contact details, you know, but you can of course just talk to me afterwards, all right? So with that, uh, well, thank you. That was my presentation. Uh, any questions on that? A afterwards, we're actually going to do a live demo of this, you know, in, in a minute or two. But any questions on, uh, on, on pervasive sensing or, or things, you know, sensors? Yeah. Okay, yes. Uh, Joe, sorry, you, you mentioned the, the, the LNG vessel offshore. Um, yeah. What's the main communication uh, throughput? Is it is all VSAT communication coming off the oh, vessel? I, how, the, how the communication between the vessel and onshore is done, I don't really know. I think we can be quite, pretty certain it's over IP anyway. <laughs> yeah. I know uh, everything which is used for control is using foundation field bus. And, and a lot of the asset monitoring is doing wireless hard on the boat itself, you know, but yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there's just talk these days about mm. media orbit, uh, satellites and so on. Yeah. How bandwidth is going to increase, what sort of ground stations you need. Yeah. I'm just curious what the requirements Yeah. I, I, I honestly don't have, I was not involved in, in, that, in that IT piece of it, you know? Oh, yeah. so, Apparel, perhaps? Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> yeah. yeah actually, uh, from 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 a back home perspective, today uh, is still in the production. I mean, in the development. So when it comes to production, they use a VSAT, and there's a conversation on, on putting a fiber optics from the FLNG back to the one from the old chart as well. The the requirement right now uh, in the first cut of conversation is a 15 meg uh, of VSAT. Potentially, that number will go up. So uh, when it comes to production, probably we can know that the, the number is more accurate. Okay. Some questions. There was a discussion earlier about IT and OT. Uh huh. And so Emerson, you guys know OT very well. Yes. So, uh -huh. what do you what do you see? I mean, what do we need to do from IT side to get close to OT? So how can we become friends with? Uh -huh. So, any, yeah. any, anything, any observations from your side? Yeah. Well, uh, so good, well uh, uh, you know, uh, most plants, uh, I guess, uh, 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 up until now, they've, they've had this kind of very much uh, separated, you know? So, in, in fact, uh, some, some plants, they choose to have, you know, wireless hard gateways, which are kind of separated, you know, whereas other plants, yeah, you know, where I guess when the, they've had, you know, team building, whatever, you know, so Wi-Fi and wireless hard, they kind of blend together. Yeah, they are totally okay for having everything integrated into uh, one box, you know. So, uh, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, typically what people do, I mean, they have like a DMC, right, the militarized zone, you know, which is kind of the the borderline of, you know, be, between IT and OT. And I, I think if that's well defined, you know, I, I mean, if, if you know where one ends and the other one begins, I, I think there will not really be any confusion, you know. I, I guess if you mix things up too much, you know, then... Uh, they, they, they also treat you fair and something you don't cross over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Should you? Also, you know, there's this American <laughs> proverb, you know, it's like great fences make great neighbors, isn't it? Something like that, right? So, yeah. but, but, you know, and it's, I think it's very much also an understanding of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, what the differences are. You know, the IT department is, you know, five days a week, eight hours per day, and operations is seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and so, and the security requirements are slightly different, and, and, and so on. So, maybe just uh, give a pool of IP addresses to the OP, you know, and let them do whatever they want with those IP addresses, you know, and something like that. You know. Yeah. I mean, I just want to put a comment there that between IT and OT. So we want to aspect with that the community, community of interest between IT and OT, right? We, both sides have to be open, that we want to explore one and the others as well. And the, what I call, uh, when it comes to accountability, that I think the question is to decide, you know, whether it's IT, the uh, accountable body for the technology or the solutions, or the OT side. I mean, I think it's easy for me to say it here in the forums like this. But when it comes to execution, hey, I know it's very difficult, it's always, <laughs> I think, like Alan said, like, two hours and a row, right? <laughs> so, so I think, I think, I think we can start with a, with a, with a community of interest on both sides, that will bring up a lot of what I call, uh, 
where customer can interact can virtually watch our technologies and solutions in talk to them. Not only transforms our center, but it also helps us to develop some business needs of customer like you know virtual education, virtual FIT, virtual uh, uh, inspection of their wall, virtual inspection of their transmitters, with monitoring consultation. So all this business uh, can solve customers' problems like project risk or project cost. Just to give you an example, like virtual field, maybe many of the subject matter is first but available to customers, that takes a lot of time to visit to our place or visiting our place to customer side. Everything goes with the virtual factory acceptance phase. This is, these are the features from our customer. As you can see in the slide, uh, in the photo below, this was a live event in uh, in China, where our customer, when saw the demonstration to distributed speed and stuff, he asked one of our salesmen, salesperson, to be a partner into the health strategy planning. Other customers from Singapore shared on. They were they asked about doing a FAT of the hospitals which are being shipped from Sweden. You can see customers are really engaged into it and as we have tried to solve their problems. Now with this. I will now bring you the good things of pervasive testing, the live demos from our performance loop lab. The first will be around the uh, process health and safety environment, which is a specific form by Peter. The second will be on the reliability, which is the pump and steel condition monitoring. And third will be the energy management, which will be our skin trap monitoring. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mr. Lee. I'm going to demonstrate uh, how pervasive sensing can be used on the pressure relief bar. In a typical process plant, you can have hundreds of pressure relief bars that protect your plant from oxidizing pressure of a certain safe limit. Ensure that there's no unfair release. You send someone in hours to check if there is a box that on the exhaust port of your pressure relief bar. If it has been thrown off. It has been brought up to report that release has been happening for the entire eight hours. And this is not ideal. So we have a solution for you here. In the setup that we have, this is our tank and the pressure relief valve. On top of the pressure relief valve, we have the uh, position, wireless position transmitter to monitor the uh, valve position and also an acoustic transmitter on the exhaust port of the pressure relief valve. If you look over in the Delta V screen, you can see that we are expanding the tank pressure within blue. Currently, it's reading about 20, 27 psi. And the uh, opening of the uh, relief valve in green, which is about uh, minus 6. And uh, also the uh, acoustic noise that is uh, big, that is affected in red. I'm going to the throat, increase that uh, pressure so that it goes above 50 psi. Okay, you can see that the uh, tank pressure is uh, increasing on our Delta V screen. It's a uh, 37, 38, and uh, it, uh, it's still increasing. <laughs> Did you see that? Yeah. Did you yeah. see the uh, all two of? Okay, good. Yeah, I. Although the uh, release happened very fast, uh, we managed to capture that uh, both the uh, 708 acoustic transmitter as well as the position transmitter managed to capture the uh, state and time span of that release as well as duration that opened. It happened very fast, but we uh, are able to capture that. So, this information can be used for regulatory release reporting, process troubleshooting. Overhaul of pressure relief after release, or for you to schedule a service to stop sick leak after. Well, I, I think that's all I have for my demo. I'm going to pass on to the.